The first dozen episodes of the series followed human phylogeny from the origin of life through the development of the first animals in the sea, and now we've finally moved on to dry land, mostly. In passing, we glanced at several different clades of fish, most of which are now entirely extinct. Remember that 90% of all taxonomic families that have ever existed are only known from the fossil record. So there was an awful lot we could have looked at, but we didn't look at any of these other lineages to explore any of them more deeply, because in this series, we're only pointing out the ones that are relevant to or closely related to our own phylogenetic ancestry. The same goes for all those earlier forks in the road, too, the ones leading to mollusks and arthropods and other things with thousands more interesting species than the relative few we've seen or will see in along the course we're on. But at least you have some idea that evolution is not like a ladder, that life branches out in every possible direction, such that the tree of life might be better represented as a tumbleweed. And were we to stray from this path, we would quickly be lost among whole other voluminous categories of animals far more diverse and unique than most can imagine. And that's just if we're talking about the species that are still alive today. But those represent only about 1% of everything that has ever lived. Almost everything we've seen in this series so far, and most of the things that we will see from here on, died out entirely tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years ago. As many animals as there are today, there were orders of magnitude more that no human has ever seen alive. A proper phylogeny should include everything we know of, extant or extinct, in one extensive tapestry, illustrating what an amazing maze the tree of life really is. We talked about how the evolution of these animals is revealed in taxonomy and in the fossil record parallels their patterns of growth in an embryo. This confused 19th century scientist trying to be the first ones to understand evolution. Ernst Haeckel, for example, said that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, meaning that he thought that embryological development carried an organism through all the adult stages of its ancient ancestry. For example, he thought that since all mammalian embryos have pharyngeal gill slits, then he took them to be essentially fish at that stage, and that as they continued to develop, he thought they'd become amphibians and then reptiles and so on, as he understood those terms back then. While Heckel's assertion was disproved soon after, there's still a noticeable parallel indicated in the study of Evo Devo, comparing biological development with evolutionary development. For example, different stages in the development of feathers found in a chronological sequence of dinosaur fossils have been shown to exactly match the sequence of development of those same structures in the feathers of living birds today. So it's not repeating the adult stages of our distant ancestors, but rather their embryology, such that the development of a fish, amphibian, or reptile may be similar to our own development up to a point, representing the point of our evolutionary divergence from that bow plan. And this is why whale embryos and even glass snake embryos still have hind leg buds, which are subsequently reabsorbed. It's why bird embryos still have three fingers in their hands, and why birds and people still have long tails in embryo. It's also why vertebrate embryos are so similar to each other, and mammalian embryos especially. One of the laws of evolution is that the young of two closely related species look more alike than the adults do, again, following a pattern of divergence from common ancestry. Of course, if we're talking about comparing our embryos to that of modern species of fish, amphibians, and reptiles, then they may have built up differences too, because we didn't evolve from them, but from our ancient ancestors who were also their ancestors. So they've had hundreds of millions of years since that divergence to continue growing on their own and to become distinct from us. They don't change that much at that level, though, because normally evolution is an accumulation of usually slight, incremental, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. Those levels of similarity distinguish the taxonomic clades that we've been talking about throughout this series, and changes in superficial surface features represent the vast majority of all evolutionary variants. The general rule is, the more distantly related any two organisms are, the deeper you'll have to look to find those similarities. However, in the entirety of human evolution flowing through the billions of individually trivial but cumulative mutations you've inherited, there are relatively few developmental changes. Being fundamental, they're consequently rare and comparatively significant. And we're going to talk about one of the most important developmental changes now. Most of the tetrapods in the early Carboniferous period would have looked like salamanders or like lizards, which are pretty similar except for the addition of claws, as we mentioned in the last video. Otherwise, even though they could now mate on land, the females still had to lay their eggs in the water, usually at the water's edge, like toads today still do. And this gives them the most warmth and light, but it also leaves them more susceptible to drying out should the water level subside. 
It also left them open to infection and predation. So some of these animals buried their eggs in piles of moist leaves and mud, but that doesn't solve the problem. And one group of these semi-amphibious quasi-reptiles began laying eggs that were contained within a thin membranous shell, about like the skin of a grape. And this waterproof skin kept the egg from drying out, but it was also porous enough to let oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. And this type of upgrade could be easily predicted given what we understand about natural selection under these conditions and the way that certain membranes will dry out and contract with air. But the more significant developmental change was not on the outside of the egg but the occurrence of extra embryonic membranes on the inside. Within the leathery shell is another inner skin called the chorion. Both are waterproof. Within that is the allantois, which is the reservoir for waste, just as the yolk is a source for nutrition. At the center of all that is an amniotic sac filled with amniotic fluid. And this little change made a huge difference because it meant that amniotes could now venture into drier areas that were inaccessible to more basal tetrapods because the brook you drink from may not be able to support your eggs too. I remember a creationist summarizing this in a ridiculous way, as if there was an individual fish who decided to grow legs and go walk on land one day. But if you followed this series and you saw that just that one little bit of the evolutionary story took four videos covering a sequence of at least nine named clades evolving over 80 million years from the late Silurian through the entire Devonian and into the early Carboniferous period where we still are now. So assuming you accept that you're a tetrapod because you have four limbs and vertebrae and so on, and assuming you accept that you're a reptiliomorph because of your keratinized skin and nails, then since you undoubtedly developed from an amniote egg, do you accept that you are an amniote? Yeah.